Good afternoon, good evening, or good morning, wherever we are located. We take this opportunity to welcome you all to this interesting uh, webinar this afternoon that is going to focus on how libraries can redesign their spaces to enhance the learning experience for students within the higher, higher education community in Africa. Um, I would want to hand you over to our moderator for the event, uh, is, um, in the person of uh, Miss Selikem Doglo, who is an assistant librarian with the Accra Technical University here in Ghana. She's going to view the moderation, introduce the speakers, and moderate the program till it's over. So at this point, um, I want to hand you over to Mrs. Doglo. So, Sally, please take over from here and uh, fly us to the land, the promised land. Please unmute yourself and uh, go ahead with your. Great. All right, so thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much, Mr. Kalite, for having me. I don't, I just don't want to waste time at this moment. I just want to go on to introduce Professor Amavi Akakovi of Accra Technical University. He is the pro VC of Accra Technical University. Uh, he's a researcher and winner of so many awards in the engineering field. So, Prof, kindly take over. Thank you. Hello, can you hear me? Hello, good afternoon. Please, can you hear me? Yes, yeah, we can hear you, Prof. Prof, we can hear you. Prof, we can hear you. Too. Sorry for the shock. Um, it must be some technical challenges. I was so well connected. I was hearing everything and even speaking. Only the space you call my name, then the system went up. Thank you very much and welcome once again to our webinar series. Today we are looking at redesigning our library spaces to improve learning experiences. Let me begin by saying that a reputable library does not only stack into printed material. This has, has to be with the olden days, you know, or just providing portals to access online resources. But today, um, a modern library should encourage collaborative learning and scholarship and provide a flexible learning space uh, that has, for instance, a reading room, space for discussion, <clears throat> innovative learning centers, center for visually challenged people, for instance, maybe cyber library, video conferencing, and more importantly, let me say, a modern library should adapt to what we call the, the learning style of the new generation of students we have. Because you see, as time goes on, we keep having different type of people. Recently, and it's not me saying it, you have been saying it, there is this generation, these student, they are characterized by many different things. In nature, these are people who are digital, native digital pharmacy. They like social networks, they like being online, and they like having, you know, a short interaction. They are practical. They don't like long learning. So library as a supportive mode, you know, of learning also has to, to change, to metamorphose, to adapt to this new generation of students and then to accommodate them so that it can keep providing the support that is expected. Modern academy library, for that matter, must respond to both pedagogical changes and technological changes. 
accommodating these changes in the library space design and management. Fortunately, I may say that several of the modern library we know are trying to integrate features of the traditional form of learning as well as digital form of learning. And I think a few cases may be cited for success, even in Ghana. However, the question is still big to answer whether most of our library in Ghana and even in Africa, are they meeting these typical challenges I just mentioned? Do they really meet you know, the learning requirement and need of this new generation by providing, as I said, a reading room, a space for discussion, innovative centers, centers for video learning, video conferencing, and what have you. This webinar in actual fact will interrogate the discussion on the changing phases of academic libraries. We should get that clear as we leave this discussion how library has changed from phases to phases and where are we now? Our hope is to explore ideas relating to how um, efficiently we can remodel existing library with the help of new architectural design so as to utilize the space effectively to provide all these things I mentioned. We also anticipate uh, the possibility of discussing innovative approaches to inculcate the digital you know, literacy development within our present library systems for optimum user experiences. Arguably, I may say that a newly designed library space has direct impact on the participation and learning needed to enhance student experience. And therefore, we should all seek for it. I am therefore privileged to welcome you all to this webinar. I want to thank AAU and all partners just in these few minutes, I thought I saw that we were 56. Before I reconnect again, we are 98, and I see that quite a lot of people are here. You are welcome. I want to welcome you to this webinar once again. It is my prayer that you, you all find the conversation very exciting and interesting and learn a lot of lessons, and also that you shall participate in co-creating the ideas that will translate later into the overall enhancement of our library spaces. On this note, I thank you very much and I wish you the best for the webinar. Welcome and enjoy the webinar once again. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Please can you hear me? Okay. Yes, thank we can hear you. Professor Amavi Akakovi for the welcome address. Um, without much I do, I want to continue to invite the first speaker in the person of Dr. Samuel Kote Ni Kwe. He is the librarian for the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology with an excellent track record in library management and administration hello yeah. can you hear me all of you yeah we yes, can yes we can hear you uh, uh thank you very much uh, for inviting me and thank you for uh the excellent introduction uh my name is uh, samuel uh, nikwe as uh, was rightly said i work in KNUSC. i haven't been there so long uh, let me say before I give this presentation that uh, I am not an expert in learning space design. I have been trained as an interior decorator or an architect, so I want to issue that disclaimer. What I want to share with you this afternoon is a little experiment we had in KNUST uh, to really look at our learning spaces and see how best we can enhance uh, them to inspire students to use the library uh, more effectively. I I'm very confident that there are many of you out there who are more knowledgeable and experienced in this area. I actually met a student recently who told me that she wrote her master's dissertation on learning space design. If she's part of this audience, I'm sure she'll have a lot more to tell us. So this is more a discussion of um, some way of thinking about uh, the services we provide uh, and uh, how to make it better. 
Uh, and I invite all of you at the end to share your experiences uh, in this particular area uh, so that together we can learn uh, and um, improve on the work that we do within our universities. So thank you all very much uh, for having me. Uh, I'm giving this presentation with my colleague Vivian, uh, a junior assistant librarian, and I know my colleague Mark Anthony from Cape Coast, who has done an excellent work uh, in UCC, would also come in later on and share his experience. Uh, so let us start. Can you see the screen now? Yes, we can. Oh, you can see the screen now. Okay. Yes. So uh, this presentation is about uh, redesigning uh, library spaces to inspire learning. Uh, this is not working. Sorry, a uh, little technical glitch. Ah, there, there you go. I see black it in this form. Mm, okay. So this is the presentation outline. Um, I will start by looking at the changing faces of higher education and learning in general. Uh, we'll look at uh, our mandate as a university and our mission, what we are uh, being called to do. Uh, and then we'll look at the library within the context of higher education and what we do as librarians. Um, hopefully, uh, we'll zoom on to the learning uh, the next generation. It looks as if uh, Prof uh, uh, has seen my presentation because everything I have here, he has already talked about. Uh, so um, these are the things that we are covering. We'll look at uh, developing pedagogical models, uh, issues around technology-mediated learning, some ideas about uh, space design concepts that we should think about. And this is just based on our experience in KNUST. Uh, share a little bit of the KNUST story and then end with some key lessons and questions and comments uh, from yourselves. So we start by first of all, looking at the changing faces of higher education. Uh, it is important to note that um, there have been some key drivers shaping the higher education landscape over the past few decades. Uh, we all agree that openness uh, has become a defining feature and ideology of 21st century learning. Technology is becoming more pervasive um, and impacting on the educational landscape. More people are coming into the higher education space, increasing number of students, very diverse, whether they are full-time, part-time, online, uh, weekend uh, 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 students. But... Uh, also very important is the financial pressures on university uh, to do more with less. Uh, and um, there is um, a move towards em embracing inter- and transdisciplinary approaches to how we work within our universities. And all of these factors are important uh, when it comes to looking at uh, learning uh, space design. When we go back to the uh, question of learning and the different phases that it has gone through. Uh, the literature seems to indicate that we have moved uh, from education 1.0 to education 1.5 with different elements embedded in it. So when we look at education 1.0, uh, the form of education and learning was more didactic. Uh, it was built around uh, buildings, brick and blocks and uh, the teacher was the center of everything he was more or less the sage on the stage it was very classroom oriented and technology was totally forbidden uh, move on and then we come into an uh, era where the dialectics starts to shape up and uh, learning becomes more socially constructed so it is not just about bricks but it's also about clicking uh, the teacher is still at the center of it all but we find that classrooms are beginning to move into the outdoors and technology is penetrating that environment uh, in the form of, if you like, even uh, calculators. Uh, by the time we get to education 3.0, learning is becoming anywhere, anytime. We don't just 
uh, click. We now connect. Uh, it is becoming more students and learner centered. Um, the classroom is beginning to appear, disappear, uh, and technology is becoming more diffused. Uh, and then into another era where it is not just about ubiquitous uh, computing uh, and learning everywhere, anytime, but now it's not about clicking and connect connecting, but also constructing. Uh, the learner-centered approaches are beginning to take shape. And instead of learning plans, we now talk about creativity plans and um, virtual reality and smart uh, technologies are beginning to uh, 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 take center stage. Um, people now talk about Education 5.0, which is a more humanistic approach to learning and education. What do we do with the learning um, and uh, who delivers the learning? We find that, for example, it is not just one to many as in the uh, age of the teacher, uh, but now it is many to one and many to many. Uh, creativity is very central. We are looking at how learning uh, and the technology and everything can help us improve our well-being uh, and shape uh, 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 lives and uh, protect our planet. So uh, if you look at uh, the, uh, the educational trajectory, we can say that we have moved from a very dualist view of learning where it was just teacher and the students to a very relativist view of learning uh, in the continuum. Uh, and when we talk about the dualist view of learning, uh, these are some of the essential characteristics of that view of learning, which is very old, antiquated view about what learning should be about. Uh, in this dualist view, uh, learning is about a people, a student who is assumed to be a novice and is blind in many respects. It is all built around lessons structured by a teacher who was the only authority. Uh, it was in a classroom where you were seated and you have to keep quiet, you can't talk. Uh, and it was more about how you pass examinations based on recalling facts. Um, we zoom on to... Right. right. Is, is the screen moving now? Sorry. Ye yes. Yes. Right. Okay. Uh, I apologize once again for the uh, disruption. Uh, I am hoping that... Um, we can catch up. So this is what I was, let me just go over the slides, which I was showing very quickly. Um, I said, this is going to be the presentation outline. We would look at um, the changing phase of higher education, uh, our mandate as universities, uh, the library in the context of higher education, uh, the learning and the next generation pedagogical models, uh, technology mediated learning, uh, space design concept, uh, the KNUSD story, and some lessons and questions and comments at the end. Oh. So I said we'll start with the changing phase of higher education. So this is what I was talking about, um, that um, there are key drivers shaping higher education. Uh, openness has become a defining feature and ideology of higher education. Technology is becoming more pervasive. Um, more people are accessing higher education, increasing number of students, uh, very diverse, be they full-time, part-time, or weekend uh, 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 students. There's quite a lot of financial constraint on universities to do more with less. And I also noted that um, there is a more inter- and transdisciplinary approaches to how universities are supposed to work. Uh, and this is what I was talking about in terms of the different phases that education and learning has gone through uh, over the years, starting from education 1.0, uh, very didactic uh, kind of uh, learning environment, uh, which was had a teacher at the center uh, of the stage. Uh, he was the authority and it was all around classrooms with technology uh, totally forbidden. And we have moved uh, from that phase to education 2.0, uh, where technology is beginning to pe uh, penetrate our learning environment. Learning is becoming more socially constructed um, and uh, it is occurring more outdoor uh, to 
uh, another phase in our development where it wasn't just about learning in a classroom, but now learning anywhere, anytime, uh, and connected to knowledge systems and resources. Uh, at this stage, we start to see uh, a more student-centered approach to how learning occurs. Uh, technology is becoming more diffused. Uh, and we have moved on, uh, again, uh, not just to clicking and connecting, but now constructing knowledge together. Um, and virtual reality and other smart technologies are taking over. Uh, and there is a projection that we are now entering into the phase of um, a humanistic mode of education and learning, where we are looking at how we can develop skills um, to uh, survive as a society and improve the well-being of our people and our planet. So we've gone through all these phases of education. And I'm arguing that when you look at it from uh, the, uh, education 1.0 to 5.0, where we are now, uh, we can argue that uh, we see a trajectory which is oriented around education from the point of view of a dualist view. And then moving on to what I call a relativist view of uh, uh, learning. Uh, that continuum has carried on going into the future. So relativism is beginning to uh, 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 take over from dualism so far as education and learning is concerned. Uh, I also noted that there are very key elements of the uh, dualist view, which we have to be mindful of. Uh, and in that um, old antiquated view of learning, learning was about um, a student who was deemed to be a novice and blind. Uh, so you needed a teacher who was more the authority to structure lessons and deliver it and fill their heads uh, as if uh, they, they are containers. Uh, the learning occurred in a classroom setting. You sit behind a desk. Uh, in, in our case, a library desk. You cannot talk to anyone. It has to be quiet. And it was more geared towards examination and recall of facts. Uh, this mode of education ended up producing uh, students uh, who have qualification but without education. Uh, so over the years, uh, this has changed and we are beginning to witness um, a, a learning uh, environment and culture which is more contextualized uh, I say learning is now done in a space rather than in a place. Uh, and when learning is done in a space, we, we, we see learning as more uh, socially situated and synchronous. Uh, it is more participative and active. It is around constructivism and connectivism and collaboration. Uh, it is more experiential and it is done anywhere and anytime. Uh, and that is the uh, emerging uh, a, a way in which uh, learning is beginning to take shape. So to summarize these developments, uh, we can say that within the dualist mode of learning, learning was more a solo exercise. The intention was to fill the brain as a container. It was me learning. You do it on your own. Nobody else is involved. And we are now moving more towards um, a social interventionist approach to learning where instead of me learning, it is more we learning, uh, learning together. Uh, learning has become more social. And the key elements of these social approach, uh, approach to learning uh, is about uh, creativity. Uh, it's about sharing knowledge. It's about um, collaborating and participating, uh, the use of digital technologies and tools uh, occurring all over. And um, that is the kind of learning we are all beginning to experience now and embracing. Uh, so I want to make the point that learning is now more social, uh, based around uh, connectivity, uh, based around uh, specific values intended to be more discursive, uh, skill-based oriented, um, and um, many other elements of it, which a lot of you will be very familiar with. It is not just about texts and about books. It is about more than that. Uh, and that's this changing notion of learning is something that I want us to hold at the back of our minds when we come to looking at uh, learning spaces. So we focused on 
now on the our mandates as universities and what we are intended to do uh, i hope you can all hear me and uh, you can um, um see the slides moving can they see me Why is this so good? Yes, Doc, we can. So, uh, we look at our mandates and mission as a university. Mm -hmm. So, I'll use the example of KNUST, which is where I work. Uh, when you go to our university website, you would find out it says our mandate is to provide higher education and undertake uh research and disseminate knowledge and foster relationships with bodies outside uh, and our mission is to provide an environment for teaching research entrepreneurship uh, in science and technology for socio-economic development in africa and elsewhere uh, curiously missing in the mission statement is a word a word which i have been looking for and a word that i think should feature there and uh, that word which is missing is learning. Uh, I say, where is the learning in our mission statement? Uh, the absence of the word learning uh, from the mission statement actually suggests something. There is a view in universities here in Ghana and I dare say Africa and elsewhere that in the minds of many people, teaching equals learning. So once you have a teacher who is standing there delivering lecture notes uh, and the students actually taking those notes, uh, learning has occurred. It is, uh, uh, learning is about the teacher. Learning is about what occurs in the classroom. So there's not too much emphasis. Uh, 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 there's a lot of emphasis on teaching rather than cultivating learning as a separate activity which needs attention. And I think that is a problem a, a very big problem that we need to rethink about. Uh, teaching and providing information doesn't equal knowledge. Uh, Albert Einstein said, information is not knowledge. Uh, uh, teaching has an element of learning in it, but teaching is not knowledge. It, it's not learning. Uh, the teaching occurs in a classroom intervention. The learning occurs elsewhere. Uh, and we have to ask ourselves in the uh, with the growing number of students all around that, when we as lecturers turn and teach them in the classroom, where do they go and engage in practical learning activities? Uh, so that brings in uh, the library and what we do within this whole uh, uh, space. I have tried here to suggest that as librarians, uh, we do a number of things which I have summarized into four blocks. I mean, some of you may agree with me or, or disagree or may... Uh, categorize this uh, uh, separately, but uh, we provide access to learning resources, uh, whether they are print resources or digital resources. Um, we also provide access to learning tools, um, whether they are referencing tools or uh, plagiarism detection tools or, or, or whatever. Increasingly, as librarians, we have become engage in learning support in the form of information and this digital literacy training and skills training. Uh, all these things are important, but I want to focus on a learning environment, which is something that I think we are responsible for uh, and that we should embrace and that we should promote and that we should be advocates of. Uh, so the focus will be on the learning environment uh, and, and, and what we should be doing about that space. So uh, it begs the question, what is a learning environment? I mean, a rhetorical answer would say it's a place where people learn. And this can be either physical, virtual, or even blended. Uh, an environment of learning is like a, le a, a knowledge garden or a learning garden. Um, we want an environment that is... Uh, has a very positive ambience, uh, which provides space for interaction and many physical activities, obviously providing access to uh, learning resources. But we want spaces that are varied and diverse so that different people can utilize it differently, uh, and a space that is also safe and secured. Um, 
So if that is what we want, then we have to go back and look at the uh, learning in the context of what we call the next generation. Uh, and I said earlier on that a prof seems to have seen my slides, uh, because when we look at the next generation and their uh, behavior when it comes to learning, uh, it was Mark Prensky who coined the term digital natives to describe this group of people who were born in the cultural and in the digital age and who have specific cultural lifestyle. They like connectivity, they like more of social interaction and even interaction in the virtual space. They have a very naive faith in the internet as their main source of information. Uh, they want to share knowledge around commu communities of um, shared purpose and values, uh, and they are more addicted to multimedia knowledge resources that can be played back several times, and they, they prefer experiential uh, uh, forms of learning. And that is the kind of generation of uh, learners that we have coming into our universities and our learning environment. And it begs the question, how should we be responding to these cultural lifestyle and behavior changes when it comes to learning vis-a-vis -vis what we do in the library as librarians? Uh, so for this group of people, I'm sure we are all familiar with questions about learning styles. I won't uh, belabor the, the, the point, but uh, we, these different groups of uh, 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 students um, have recognized differences when it comes to their learning preference based on interest, ability, and other factors. Uh, we see uh, visual learners who want to learn through drawing, using pictures, images, uh, and, and many other visual uh, uh, elements. There are people and uh, learners who are oriented towards auditory forms of learning so that the verbal and the uh, uh, discussions are very important to them in how they learn. We have kinetistic uh, learners who like learning by doing and touching. So they want movement across space. They don't want to be fixated in one place. Uh, and uh, how do we cater for these uh, uh, group of learners? And then we have the read-write learners. Uh, and this is what maybe traditionally we as librarians have been interested in learning through words, through textbooks, uh, and through all the print media that we provide. But obviously the evidence shows incontrovertibly that uh, the learning interests, styles, and approaches are different. And therefore we should have spaces that respond to these various forms of uh, learning behavior. Um, I also want to touch on pedagogical models and uh, how they are also impacting on learning and therefore what implications that ha uh, has uh, for the learning spaces that we provide. From teacher-centered pedagogies to what is now referred to as learner-centered pedagogy, where the learner takes responsibility for their learning. There's more autonomy of the learner uh, and independence of the learner. They are out there to discover things for themselves. They are uh, kind of their own teachers. Uh, the interest of learner-centered pedagogy is about developing transferable skills um, uh, developed through critical uh, thinking and reflective and problem-solving activities. Uh, it's a form of learning where what is learned, uh, when it is learned, the pace at which the learning occurs, it's all in the hands of the learner. Uh, and um, it is about having a very active uh, learner voice uh, and interest uh, in the learning journey. So the, these are elements of these uh, new ways of thinking about pedagogy in terms of uh, uh, teaching and learning delivery processes. So based on uh, these learner-centered pedagogies, we find very innovative pedagogies coming up uh, these days. Uh, some of you will be familiar with uh, the conversational learning framework uh, developed by Dinah Laurie Ladd and uh, many other people who have written on this subject, where conversations provide the opportunity for learning and knowledge construction and meaning making. It is an authentic form of learning. Uh, you go to places around Europe and there are small, small coffee shops where people dip in and have little conversations. 
And as part of these conversations, people led. Uh, collaborative learning is beginning to take uh, center stage within our universities, where a group of people can learn by doing a task together. Uh, Play-based learning also, which is, has benefits for lifelong learning. Um, I am particularly interested in the work of Sugata Mitri. Uh, some of you would know, and for those of you who are not uh, familiar with Sugata Mitri, I encourage all of you to look him up. Uh, he developed what was called the famous hole in the wall experiment, which demonstrated that um, we can learn uh, on our own by ourselves without uh, uh, not being taught by anyone. Self-organized learning has become uh, an essential part of the new innovative pedagogies uh, uh, evolving. Uh, Problem-based learning, where the learning uh, is driven by a motivation to solve a particular problem. Uh, and it involves a lot of research and uh, application of knowledge and skills in specific ways to solve a particular problem. Uh, we've talked earlier on about mobile learning, which is learning across many contexts, anywhere, anytime with electronic devices, game-based learning. And we could go these various innovative pedagogies, which are all designed to respond to the learning needs and learning behavior uh, of the emerging uh, 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 digital migrants uh, within our educational ecosystem. Uh, so to sum up, all I'm saying is that students and learners are pushing learning into a new dimension. And therefore, as librarians, uh, it will be a mistake to continue to serve them in the traditional time-worn ways. Uh, we have to embrace ways of presenting our learning environment to our students so that it is responsive to their needs and that um, they would have value for money in terms of what they uh, uh, pay us to do. Let me say just a little bit about technology-mediated learning. We have made the point already that technology has become very central to what we do now uh, within our libraries. And all of us uh, agree that it has become very pervasive and ubiquitous. Uh, but um, in terms of um, technology-mediated learning, um, I want to actually distinguish between uh, two forms of technology-mediated learning which is learning through technology and learning with technology. Uh, there is a certain mindset about deployment of technology across our universities, where the view is that uh, we have to learn through technology. When we say learning through technology, the view is that the technology is the only device that you have to have for the learning to occur. So you sit behind a screen and that is the only tool available to you. So you learn through that tool alone. When you learn with technology, the technology is part of the learning, but there are other things going along with the technology, whether it is a notebook by your side, a textbook by your side, uh, whether it is uh, a people that you talk to at the same time, uh, or things that you are doing whilst you are learning. So you dip in between these different elements uh, for the learning to occur. Uh, and we have to embrace learning through technology, but also uh, develop a better understanding of learning with technology. And I like the learning with technology approach so that the emphasis is not so much on the technology as a tool, but other activities that go on around the uh, the technology itself. Um, so now let's come to the uh, key issue that uh, we want to address this afternoon. By bringing all these changes, um, pedagogical changes, technological changes, behavioral changes, uh, and the many other changes occurring in our environment to say that what should we be thinking about when it comes to space design uh, so far as our library spaces uh, are concerned. Um, like I said, I am not an expert on space design, uh, but what I have here on the screen are examples of some of the things that we considered in KNUST 
when we started to look at the spaces that we make available to our students. Uh, so we want a space uh, which has a, a mood and an ambience for learning, which is uh, uh, comfortable, a variety of furniture that students can use, uh, spaces which are multi-purpose, um, so not the, just the traditional ones, but ones that can be used in very specific ways. Uh, we were looking at um, areas and spaces where you can learn with um, other tools um, and uh, also issues about security and the surveillance as many people come into our library environment. I'm sure you can add to this list uh, various conceptual designs when it comes to space. Uh, I don't know whether in our library schools they still teach library architecture, but when we did uh, some of these things featured uh, in our educational curriculum uh, going back uh, into the past. Mm. But we want spaces that enhance learning, uh, that are relaxed, uh, I dare say even playful in a manner. Mm. So now let me share with you specifically the KNUSD story uh, and what we try to do pulling all these uh, 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 concepts together and then looking at ways in which we can change or enhance uh, the learning experiences of our learners. Uh, so this is where our story started. Uh, this is the old traditional environment, uh, library environment, which I dare say still features in many other universities today. Uh, you, it's a Dickin it was what I call the Dickensian era, and I think some of my colleagues may be listening to me now. Uh, I have used the word Dickensian over and over in the past. Uh, but if you look at the type of furniture that we make available with Berlin Wall uh, partitioning all across uh, 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 and all that, and that was because we believed that learning must be an individual affair. Uh, which is why I still go around universities in Ghana and I see these Berlin Wall furniture constructions around our library buildings. Um, we have spaces which were just packed with shelves and books on end all over the place. And uh, it was based on the belief that the more books you make available, the more you enhance learning. <laughs> Students come into the library space and they have nowhere to sit because Every space has been filled with shelves. Uh, we thought that uh, the books are important, the shelves are important, but other things are important. So we wanted to change that uh, narrative. Uh, so we embarked on what I like to term uh, disruptive innovations, which is based around uh, the, I think it's a theory developed by a gentleman called Christensen, uh, if, if, if I'm right. But the idea about disruptive, uh, disruptive innovation is that we wanted uh, to innovate in ways that responds to the needs of our learners. We wanted to move from just being information watchmen as librarians uh, to knowledge and learning ambassadors uh, and, 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 and then make learning more enjoyable and uh, inspirational for the people who come into our learning environment. So this is what we did. We gave consideration to the different learning spaces that we have, uh, and we try to categorize them into three main zones, uh, using the traffic lights um, as a guide uh, for what you can do in specific uh, uh, spaces across the library. Let me just add quickly that uh, this space redesign was mainly in our main library, the Premier the Second Library, uh, but we want to move it on further into our college libraries. And I'll come to something else later on uh, uh, in, in my presentation about where we are going with all this. But the red area of uh, red learning zone is what we call our contemplative learning space. Uh, this is the, the traditional, I sit down quietly contemplating and reading on my own uh, kind of space. So we didn't get rid of that. We still had that one. But then we also created collaborative learning spaces and group uh, learning spaces. And then we have uh, social learning spaces, uh, which we call the conversational learning spaces. 
So contemplative, collaborative, and conversational were the three learning spaces that we wanted to create. So just to give an example of what this means in practice, as I start with the conversational learning space, like I have said earlier on, conversations are very important in how we learn. You find students, uh, they finish lecture, they want to sit somewhere and have conversation uh, about the lecture and what the teacher said and what is it that they understand or didn't understand, or sometimes they just want to take a break. So our green learning zone is a social conversational learning space. It is designed for social interaction. In that space, you are allowed to receive phone calls. Uh, you can have drinks in syllable cans. We have television installed in that uh, open area at the entrance of the library. We showed uh, BBC news and other news. Uh, there are documentaries. Uh, and things that we subscribe to. Uh, you can have a uh, reading of magazines and many other. Um, we have a cafe, uh, but the cafe is just outside the conversational learning area. So you can dip out very easily uh, to our IC cup area and have a snack. Uh, but we promote interaction uh, uh, in different forms uh, through conversations. We want people to talk to themselves to talk to each other uh, and it's an authentic form of learning like i said and this is documented in the literature so this is an example uh unfortunately i didn't get a picture of the actual entrance where people congregate we had specific uh, uh, tools that we put out there where people could sit but basically we wanted them to have conversations among themselves mm. Then we created another space, which is more the collaborative learning space. There were two different spaces for the collaborative learning space. There was an open collaborative learning space and another collaborative learning space, which was more a bookable room uh, where students could actually go and then book uh, and as a group uh, work together, uh, utilizing technology in specific ways. But collaborative problem-based learning is very uh, well documented in the literature. And as a science and technology university, people doing architecture, geology, and whatever, they like to come together as groups with group assignments to uh, work in specific spaces. So we provided this space to respond to that specific need. Uh, so it is a space where you can have group interaction in different forms. And again, here we allow people to bring uh, water and syllable cans and still uh, uh, have a drink where they sit in that space. So you find in this example, groups of people. And as you can see in this huge space, these spaces that you see used to be filled with shelves, shelves on end, uh, which we cleared to make up space. And this is what we are beginning to see in our library since we cleared those shelves. Students are coming in their numbers, sitting around. Uh, and as you can see, you see an example of uh, uh, learning with technology in these images that you see, where the computer is not the only thing. There are other things which are featuring. Um, at the top uh, corner is our bookable rooms, uh, the top and the bottom corner. You find our bookable rooms. You can uh, Students can come in and book these rooms. Uh, and then utilize it specifically, uh, specifically for collaborative learning activities. Uh, they can have screens to project things on and then, and then work together in the bookable room. So uh, these are examples and the libraries are beginning to be packed uh, with students who come in their numbers and then congregate uh, around these various uh, uh, spaces because they want to have uh, conversational learning. So we go back to the different learning styles and we see how these spaces are responding to people who are either <coughs> auditory learners or kinetistic learners. Uh, uh, and, 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 and this is an example of uh, the spaces that we make available in our library uh, currently. Mm. But like I said earlier on, we didn't also get rid of the traditional old me learning quietly, sitting my somewhere and the learning. So we also have spaces within the library for um, 
individual contemplative learning around uh, specific tables and decks. Uh, again, utilizing technology and the resources that we have available. So uh, these are just examples of what we have created. I'm sure you may have more to share when it comes to what you do in your individual library. But I want to touch on a few things uh, to try and wrap up on what I'm saying. Uh, it is important in this whole journey to think about the type of furniture we make available in our libraries. Uh, traditionally, it has been a desk and a chair in a particular way, uh, and which was in a particular color scheme, and that was it. Increasingly, we find uh, innovative furniture and sitting spaces emerging within our libraries, and I have just pulled these from um, the uh, internet as examples. Uh, you can find a particular stool in front of us, uh, the one with the gray, uh, black, and blue, where there is a socket even embedded in that, in, 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 in that uh, type of furniture. They are very colorful. They can be configured in different ways to bring different people together. So it is important that we rethink the different kinds of furniture that we provide in our library space. The other thing that we, we did, uh, talking about furniture, is that we went out and we um, actually uh, 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 purchased a very customized kind of furniture for the library, uh, which has sockets embedded uh, on them uh, with, uh, so that students who bring their laptop can sit around these tables, but can also plug in their laptops. And this was specifically uh, uh, designed and ordered for our library. And I think this is very important for us to think about when we talk about space design. Um, because uh, students come in there for collaborative activities and sometimes they want places where they can store the things that they bring along. We actually got rid of, uh, sometimes you go into libraries and at the entrance you find huge bags which have been collected, littered across the entrance. And it's very, for me, uh, very uh, 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 not very friendly, not very good. Uh, so we were keen for students to bring in their, their bags, uh, but to also have storage cabinets where they can store them uh, 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 away. And we made provision for storage cabinets uh, for, for, for uh, personal use. Uh, and because we had large numbers of students coming in, we were very conscious of security. So we insisted on students bringing their ID cards. We have installed tensiles in the library. Uh, I wish I, I, I should have shown you pictures of this. We are tagging all our books with RFID tags. There are CCTV screens and monitors across the entire library so we can monitor what people are doing. Um, we have a public announcement system installed so you can make announcements and everyone, irrespective of where they are in the main library building, can actually hear. Uh, so we, 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 we paid attention to security issues uh, in the presentation of the space. Uh, in the uh, rooms that we make available, we are conscious about the use of technology and um, accessing various services. So we have Wi-Fi deployed across the various uh, libraries. In the bookable rooms, there are uh, uh, projectors that students can use, computer workstations are available on all the floor. We are investing very heavily in the provision of ebooks. Um, you see, currently, more than 80% of the students in our universities don't live on campus, they live elsewhere. So they should be able to access these resources anytime, anywhere. Uh, and we are planning to work very closely with the e learning directorate so that we can provide e-learning support within the library itself, rather than students going elsewhere, as well as technical support. So the library will be the public face where students come to access not just learning resources, but um, uh, 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 e-learning support and technical uh, uh, services support as well. Uh, so here we have an example, and the top left corner uh, is what we call the, uh, the DEN. Uh, the, the KNUST alumni in the USA helped us to put this together, but you can find very clearly the number of students who bring their laptops connected to the uh, library Wi-Fi and then uh, uh, studying uh, uh, on their own. 
uh, provision made for sockets so they can plug in their laptops very easily and conveniently. Mm. Going forward into the future, uh, we want to develop what we call open and outdoor spaces around the peripheral of the library so that students don't need to come into a building. They can actually sit outside and study as well. Uh, and the, this is at the conceptual stage, but uh, it has all been designed. Uh, so those of you who are familiar with the KNUST library, you can see the building in the background, but an open space outside uh, where these outdoor spaces uh, will be emerging. Uh, we are hopeful that um, uh, this has now been given out to somebody who will start work uh, and construction of that space in the next few days. Uh, so this is how the outdoor spaces uh, that we want to develop uh, look like from a design point of view. Mm -hmm. uh, from a design point. So you can see the KNUST library building uh, in the background there. Mm -hmm. Now, finally, I want to talk to you about another learning space, which a more modern learning space that we are developing, uh, which we call the KNUST library mall. Uh, the idea of the mall, uh, like any shopping mall that you know, is that uh, you can buy different things from different uh, uh, shops within the mall. So we are using the conceptual idea of the mall uh, as a knowledge mall, a place where you go and shop for knowledge uh, and you have access to different uh, knowledge resources and spaces. So in this new knowledge and learning mall, uh, there will be a, a cafeteria, huge cafeteria in there. There will be bookshops. There will be training rooms, syndicating rooms. The e-learning center will be located in this mall. Uh, there will be uh, 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 libraries, uh, 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 spaces across the floor, bookable rooms. There's a conference uh, suite and facility with, uh, 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 what do you call it, uh, conferencing technology, all provided in this new space. Currently, as I speak to you, this building is going up. It's a five-story uh, building. We are now on the third level. Uh, and uh, hopefully, uh, in a year or so, for those of you who come to KNUSC, you would have uh, a view of um, our new library and learning mall. Uh, so these are images of it uh, uh, for you, for your consumption. Uh, and I'll be very happy to share with you when it is finally done, uh, where we go from here. So uh, this is what I wanted to share with you. Uh, obviously, we have had some challenges, uh, at which I want to share a few lessons with you. The question is that uh, we as librarians should think critically about our role as librarians. All right. Um, I think... Uh, Dr. Nikwe is done with his presentation. Um, I want to say that thank you very, very, very much, Dr. Nikwe, for your wonderful presentation. And it's also going to Hello. Hello, Doc. Hello. Yes, Dr. Nikwe. Hello, Selikem. Yes, I can hear you. I, I saw that you were done with the presentation. It's just that we couldn't hear you at the tail end. Um, Sorry, you so, couldn't hear me at the tail end. Yes, please. Oh, I think okay. your network All right. went off. Right, okay. Was it the last few slides? The last few Hello. slides. Say again. Yes, please. The last few slides. We just the last few it. slides. Yes, now we are on question and questions, comments, and contributions. That's a slide you yes. can see now. So, um, so um, as we are waiting for uh, Doug, we want to encourage you to leave your questions in the chat. And at the end of the presentations, um, we would give you the opportunity to ask your questions. All you need to do is to raise your hand. All right, so um, I want to acknowledge the presence of our continental and international participants 
I want to say that we are very happy to have you join us on the webinar. I want to continue with the next, we want to continue with the next speaker. We want to move on to the next speaker, who is Dr. Mark Anthony. Dr. Mark Anthony is an information scientist, professional librarian, researcher, teacher, author, and consultant. He is currently the university librarian for the University of Cape Coast. He is also the chair for the management committee of the Consortium of Academic and Research Libraries Ghana in Ghana, that's Kali, and a licensing coordinator for electronic information for libraries. So, doc, Dr. Mark Anthony, uh, if you can hear me, can you please take over? Yes, uh, so good afternoon to all of you. And, good afternoon. Uh, allow me to share my well it's not a, a very formal presentation but let me just share my screen my, my screen with you my slide with you so can you can you see my slides yes please yes they are very brief um i want to i want once again let me thank uh, uh atu and aau for giving me this platform once again to share my thoughts and experience on a subject that is uh, very dear to me. And uh, I would like to add that uh, Dr. Nikwe is was my mate at the library school. Is Even though we are colleagues, I see him as a mentor. Uh, I, I, when, when I assume office he, at UCC, I visited him. I spent a few days with him and all that he has talked about, he shared the ideas with me. And I bought into the ideas, honestly. And whatever I'm doing here is alone. Some of the discussions that we had, and we've been doing this together. So today, I just want to share. I mean, it's, it's done a lot already on the theories. Uh, I want to share the the experience what we are doing here at UCC uh, to ensure that we we have uh, state of the art facilities to support teaching and learning. Right. Um, I'll just make a few points, general points, and we we'll go on. Um, I must add that uh, the issue about redesigning is coming because of the nature of the libraries that we have. Most of the libraries that we have in our country, and I'm sure some parts of Africa, are not purposely designed libraries. These are libraries that sometimes just a lecture hall that has been turned to a library and uh, they were not planned libraries. So unlike uh, KUST, which was a planned library, some of the libraries that we are talking about were not really planned. And even those that were planned, like the big universities, some of these things that are coming were not in place. So we have to redesign. So I, I, I want to encourage those young universities and institutions that are here to put up their new libraries to ensure that some of these things are factored into the the plan so that we don't we don't go back to the redesign. The redesign can be very expensive. Sometimes you have to break it, things partitioning, and all kinds of things. And sometimes it's not the best, and it can be more expensive. So I will, I want to make that point that those of you who are here to put up your libraries, ensure that you factor all this development into your new library. Uh, the other point I want to make um, is, and Dr. Nikwe address it, is that what we are doing now as libraries is within our mandate uh, we are not doing anything outside our mandate and uh, yesterday i was at a forum and I, I made this point very clear that let's not reduce the mandate of our libraries to just providing uh, information resources to support teaching and learning our mandate goes beyond that and that's why i have a problem with those who still think that uh, libraries are no more needed because there's information uh, overload on the web or whatever they've been saying. It's not true. Uh, we also have a responsibility to provide facilities. And it's not just one facility, learning spaces, learning spaces, 
to support teaching and learning and research. A researcher need a learning space. A learner need a learning, a learning space. So we still have to library have that mandate of providing learning spaces and also learning facilities like uh, computers, internet, and all those things that support information duplication, reprographic, uh, uh, and all those services that we provide as libraries. And of course, let's not forget our mandate of uh, providing professional services as well. So um, there's a new generation of library users now, and don't get me wrong. Um, you just, doctor said that you saw the impact of how the changes that they are brought into the library was making. It's the same year at UCC. Um, you now have a situation where you have students waiting for the library to be open. As soon as it's open, they are running into the library just to go and occupy the spaces. So if we do what they want, and uh, for the first time, I, I, I was at a meeting, uh, one of the management student consultancy meeting, where we were negotiating increment of school fees. Uh, when it came to the library, they were opposing every increment. When it, could, when it came to the library, they said no. They agree with the library uh, new rate because uh, the library is using the money that they pay to to their benefits. So we need to, and we don't have to do this alone. We have to that we have to engage the students, the student leaders, so that we provide what they want. So we have no choice. And and don't get me wrong, we still. Maybe that's where maybe I would depart from my, my my colleague. We still have to maintain some setting of the traditional traditional setup in the, in the library. I've observed that there are still some people, no matter what you change, they will still want to go to the old setup. And let's not take that from them. Uh, I was in the university, I think Abana Champagne some years back. They still maintain their card catalog and so, so they are areas that they've still maintained the tradi traditional li library settings or setups, which is unique. So we are not going to completely change our traditional library setup. We're going to rather help to complement them with the new setups that we have. And Dr. made a point about multi-purpose space. I, I really buy into that idea. We need to knock design spaces that can be used for multi-purposes. It's very, very important. Because we don't have so much luxury of space uh, at our disposal, so let's have in mind that whatever space that we are we are now developing or redesigning, they they could be used for multiple purposes. There's a space that we just launched in our library. We call it Development Information Commons. I'll show you in a moment. That place is is, is going to be used for training purposes for for students' uh, discussion, group discussion. And uh, other, other other related purposes that we have here for the place. So that is also very important. I want to make this general point to you, then I tell you the UCC story. Now, what is happening in UCC is that, yes, as I said, after a thorough research and consultation with people like Dr. Nikwe, I also started this journey of ensuring that we modernize the facilities of. Uh, I, our university library. And I, I just have to share something with you here that uh, anything you want to do, if you start thinking about funding, you may not be able to do it because when I draw my plan and saw the money involved, in fact, uh, anybody would have given up because uh, looking at my budget, there was no way that I could do that. But you have to be innovative on how to raise funds to, to ensure that you are able to implement such a project. So at UCC, one of the things we have done is to uh, turn a whole, we have a, a, a if you like a three-story uh, building complex, and we have turned a whole wing of our second floor into learning commons, learning commons. And um, we have a variety of learning commons. Uh, we have, um, let me see, um, we have a, a research common, uh, where is he? A research common and knowledge common, and this is a research common uh, for the graduate students. Uh, it can take about 200 students. Uh, within this uh, space, we have some discussion rooms for groups of students and a seminar room for the graduate students. Sorry, I couldn't get a picture to show you everything, but uh, and this is what we did in 2019. Then 
we have also set up uh, another space for uh for sorry uh, undergraduates knowledge common you can stick that one knowledge common uh i think this this is the knowledge common the first one was recent common uh is a knowledge common sorry about that i think this is a recent common and uh, the other one sorry uh, it is a only common also for the undergraduates um uh, the setup of course took into consideration the needs of the various group of students uh so you can see that we have almost 100 computers in the only common because these are undergraduates and very few computers in the uh research common so there are a few change a few differences they also have their discussion rooms and also um, they don't have a seminar room then the 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 new thing we have done was to also create a, a social a, a social learning commons and uh, this in between the two commons uh, that's what we are seeing now we've created this social learning commons uh, basically uh, a space also for collaborative and group learning also multiple use um discussions are allowed training is allowed networking is allowed gaming is allowed and you, you you can just see what is happening you see students around playing chess uh, or, or, uh, or worry do, do when they are tired of learning and discussion they do multiple things there and i tell you um it's become the talk of the university is the place get full and we are we are forced to revert into a, a booking system because we have about 12 suits and if we allow free sitting we know, uh, we, there may be issues so we are we are forced it's always huge and sometimes you have even uh, faculty have international conferences wanting to bring their participants to also come and network there so it's it's something we have just done and the impact is massive so we now have a social learning common and uh, over here uh, there's some students allow and uh, users allow some freedom they can receive calls they can uh, play games, they can discuss, they can talk, some minimal amount of noise is allowed here. And that's uh, another part of the social learning common that we have done. And uh, you stand by and see student learning in a relaxed environment, and you, you, you'll be very happy to see it, that we really need to change our learning environment. And you talk to the students, they are so excited about it, and they are happy that some of these things are showing up in their library. This is also another part of uh, the social learning commons. Uh, you see some students, uh, sometimes students, staff playing games together. Then, uh, in addition to that, we have also established um, a video conferencing and uh, virtual uh, learn, virtual meeting space, also for, which, about, which has about a 40 seat capacity. And that's what I'm just sh showing now. And uh, again, uh, in the university, we realized that uh, there was no video conferencing, purposely designed one. Uh, everybody was doing his own thing, his office or their conference room. This one is a, a well-designed video conferencing facility, uh, state-of-the-art equipment, and uh, it's not serving the university community. Now we have uh, uh, vivas, online vivas, even lecturers presenting conferences from here. And for me, we are excited as a library, we've been able to put in place all these facilities that are encouraging academic work, that are encouraging teaching, learning, and research, which is uh, one of our mandates. And we are happy that uh, the library playing this role. That's still part of the, uh, the room. And um, this is another facility that we also launched recently. Um, we call here Development Information Commons. It's also another type of commons. So when you come to UCC, there are a lot of commons. Uh, senior members common, uh, social learning common, research common, and a whole lot of commons. I mean, and this place also, uh, we have made it possible that students who have laptops can go there and connect to our wired uh, cable network. Uh, they can, they are allowed to discuss. And this room, as I said, is for multi-purposes. It can also be used for training purposes. It's a large room, uh, which can take about 200 uh, people at a time. So, um, and this part of it as well. And uh, let me just share with you, we are not done. We, we still have a long way to go. Um, 
in see, and the redesigning of, of our space, we've realized that these days the students come to library with their laptops, their phones, and they always want power source to charge their laptops and their phones. So we are re we are still looking at a traditional area uh, of uh, study and uh, ensuring that we provide them with uh, sockets that they can they can uh, I mean close to their reading space so that they can charge their they can plug their phones and laptops to enhance them using their laptop and it's something that we are doing. So we in the redesigning of our space we we shouldn't forget to also improve on the traditional setup. Uh, because, uh, yes, you can still do something about the traditional setup uh, for those who still want to go there and learn. And of course, sometimes it's beautiful to be there that they also at least have some comfort and have access to whatever will facilitate their work. Um, looking into the future, um, we we are looking at uh, establishing a, res a resource center within the library. And uh, the thing about this resource center is that uh, a it's going to have a computer assisted learning facilities, uh, including assistive technologies for persons, persons with special needs. So we're going to have this lab uh, with about 50 computers, uh, very high end computers that uh, students can come, those who have uh, difficulty with language proficiency, uh, they want to learn programming, a computer program, and come and sit on their own machine learning and learn things on their own. Sometimes even we are going to work with the lecturers, those of them who are allowed to give their lecture notes, their PowerPoints for them, for it to put in the database for students to come and replay as a tutorial if they don't understand. Uh, we are going to do that as well. And all of this is just to help uh, make life uh, a little bit comfortable and easy for our students. So in the next year, this is what we are doing at UCC. And I agree with Dr. Nikwe that when you do these things, the net effect is that you see a lot of impact on, on the academic work. As you can see, uh, our university, from the higher educational ranking again, was ranked number one in Ghana, number one in West Africa, number four in Africa. And these are some of the things that we are doing uh, just to ensure that uh, uh, we we change the we, we change the, there's a paradigm shift from the from the way always of doing things and the library is also playing its part to to respond to the new emerging changes that are happening. So we encourage all other libraries to make sure that they sit down and look at the the library setting and let's ensure that we we all this is based on research as I said and consultation uh, and and we involve the students. I mean, believe me, some of the students, the student group have even contributed to support some of these projects. So there's a need to engage all the stakeholders, the, the, the students as well, and get their input into some of these designs. Don't go and do anything without their consent and their, otherwise sometimes you're going to do something that may not be pleasing them. So this is the UCC experience. I think I'll end here uh, for the sake of time. So, uh, Selikim. That's our story. That's a UCC story. <laughs> That's a wonderful story. And Dr. Mark Anthony, we are very grateful for your insightful presentation. Thank you very much. And um, we hope to learn from you. Yes, from both KNUST and UCC. Um, we want to continue um, the webinar is getting to the end and we want to just have the question and answer section. Mr. Mr. Kualite. Yes, please. I'm seeing some hands already up. Uh, Babangida yes. Aba, please, can you uh, unmute your mic? Let me allow people to unmute their mics so they can. Please unmute yourself and uh, come with your questions. Let's be brief so other people can also have the uh, opportunity to ask questions. So, Baba Anjida, please. Oh, he's gone off. Okay. So, Abdul Bahi, yes, Mohammed. Yes. Please unmute yourself and uh, ask your question.
Um, uh, first of all, uh, I would like to uh, appreciate uh, Prof and for a uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, it's such a wonderful uh, knowledge sharing. Uh, we appreciate that. Uh, um, uh, there is a place that I missed that I want to, uh, a, a bit uh, elaboration about the key lessons. Uh, he started explaining, uh, talking about the key lessons. He mentioned about three items and I stopped there. Uh, please, I need more elaboration for the rest of uh, the, the key lessons because it's very, very important to be here. Yes. Then, uh, secondly, uh, I also want to like, I like to ask a question on the issue of the learning space. Okay, what of if uh, a situation where you have a limited space in the library and uh, you want to improve that? How are you going to handle this? You have a limited space in your own library, and um, you want to try. Uh, you want to uh, the, the, like uh, the, impose this into your own library, and you have a limited space. What can you do about that? Thank you. All right. Thank you very much for your question. Uh, we take two more, and then they would respond at once. All right. Okay. No problem. Right. No problem. Thank you very much. So you can mute now. Oh. Uh, this is Kokulai. Please uh, unmute yourself and ask your question. Thank you. Please, Miss Evelyn, can you can you mute yourself? Can I please talk? Yeah, Miss Kokulai, please go ahead. Okay. Um, thanks, KNUST and UCC. Um, I find that sometimes the development office, our development offices, our architects, even not acknowledge the fact that libraries like hospitals and even classrooms are purpose built. And the library is not just any space with books in it. I was shocked when I went to a community library and right at the entrance was block work, modern day. And yet there was a librarian on a committee to build a new community library. Um, we take a lot of things for granted that you are called to serve on a committee and you are just there to, you know, um maybe take a sitting allowance forgetting that you were there to make an input you were put there so that you could make an input but most of the time we are not uh, knowledgeable in spaces so it behoves on us that we work with other professions so you will find it very um unusual to have an architect and a librarian at the same time it doesn't often happen but i was able to you know thankfully i have a librarian who was for her first degree she was an architect and my curiosity was piqued why do you leave architecture to come and do librarianship and she said it is for security reasons so her architecture was informing her in librarianship and she was using security as part of, you know, to build security in the library. That is how serious they take it in the Western world. So if you have the chance to make input from scratch, please do. I was unfortunate at a point to have my library painted. I came back from travel and found the color in the library dark brown how you can even use colors like that in a library i can't imagine so it is not just the structure it is the interior decor the paint the natural lighting the furniture that we have been told about if you have the opportunity please make all the inputs for the present and the future if you have the opportunity that is my comment thank you Thank you very much for your comments. Uh, we are grateful for your contribution and extra information.
Uh, there's Rex. We take the third one and then we answer the 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 them and then. Okay, so there are three All more right. people. So Rex, please unmute All right. and. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor Nipoy and Doctor Kogla. My question has to do with how accessible are our libraries so far for the fiscally challenge to have easy access. I'm talking about the structure, how our libraries are built to enable people who are physically challenged to have access into our libraries. If you can, they can help us uh, going into the future. Thank you very much. All right, thank you so much, Rex. You would answer your questions very soon. Um, El Kalash, Kamaluddin, please can can you unmute and give us your question okay. or contribution? Uh, a very good afternoon to everyone. Uh, that's available locally participating in the program. It's a wonderful opportunity. Uh, I may like to have a clarification as regards uh, three concepts. What are the differences or similarities? Uh, they are learning commons, knowledge commons, and maker species. Uh, secondly, let, let me let me take a bit as regards the uh, question raised by I think. Uh, the second person who raised the question. The pro if you have a, a, a little space, it's actually going to be difficult for you to explore all these um, uh, 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 innovations because the space is not there. So in often, oftentimes, the suggestion is whenever you have avenues for expansion or new structures, then you can now do in such suggestions Whosoever is actually the architects that are, that are to build the structures for you, I think that would be that, 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 that that's easier than you not having because all these things rise really around having the space to do them. Thank you so much. All right, thank you very much. Your answer will be coming very soon. The last question for now, let's take from Abiodun Adekambi. Good afternoon. This is my. I want to. I want to appreciate you for that good presentations and that hope, and the way you are taking our library too. Thank you very much for that. My my contribution. My question is this: sir. How is that? Can you make this lecture? Our presentation has to be so that we can take it to Liberia because we have to make our library a more lively place from what it from what it is from what it used to be. Thank you very much. All right, thank you so much for your question. Um, let's uh, have the answers coming from uh, Dr. Nikki and Dr. Kobla. So, yeah. thank you, each of them. Yeah. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Uh, can you all hear me? Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I don't think there are any straightforward answers to some of the questions that you have asked. Uh, certainly when I was being interviewed for my job in KNUST, uh, I gave a presentation and I suggested that I was going to do all this. And I still remember the chair of the panel asking me, how are you going to do this? Have you seen the building? Um, it is nearly impossible and they are old churches. Um, obviously, I came and I saw it. And I realized that uh, there are ways of reconfiguring spaces without doing any damage to the old structure. So what you see in the presentation there is what we are tempted to do. I am not saying that uh, the spaces that all of you have, you can fit things into it that same way. Uh, but where it is possible to reconfigure the spaces, like I told you, where you see the group learning area, that broad space, they were filled with shelves and tables, uh, endless. We cleared half of the building uh, and we made space for it. Um, it was a, a very, uh, yeah, yeah, what do you call, bold thing that we had to do, mindful of the fact that people resist it. But I was very uh, confident and, uh, and my team were very confident that based on the literature, we know that providing access to these learning spaces are very important. So it is horses for courses. When and where you have a space where you can reconfigure to fit things in, then please do. Uh, somebody talked about having a little space. I think I mentioned earlier on 
that we are not just limiting ourselves to the internal spaces. We are going outdoor. We are going outdoor as well. So there may be physical spaces around the peripheral of the library. That's why you don't need anything. And there is no reason why you cannot give consideration to providing access to learning spaces outside these areas. And I have also said earlier on in my presentation that learning spaces are not just physical. They are also very virtual and they can be blended. So there are other ways in which we can provide access to these learning spaces. Uh, some of you will be familiar with the work of uh, Professor Jilly Salmon, who talks about online moderation. It is all learning an online environment. Maybe these are things that we can give consideration to. There is no one single answer to the question, but um, we have to think creatively uh, about how we can remodel these spaces we don't need to destroy the old, but we can have the old and the new coexisting together. Uh, I respond to the question of collab collaboration with the development office. I think that is very, very important. When I realized that buildings were springing up in KNUST uh, uh, without any library and learning spaces, I actually went to the development office myself. In fact, I have offered to give them a talk on uh, uh, learning in the digital age. I want to share my view as a librarian with them so that to, together we can think about how we uh, uh, present these spaces. The library mall, which you saw, it was a battle. Uh, the original idea was from the library and it was left to them to design. They went and they did something from their professional point of view. Uh, I had to intervene and I said no. Even then, I was getting, I was given very little time to make my input, but I insisted on the things that I want. Uh, and some of the things that you see featured in that new construction was as a result of sitting uh, with the, uh, uh, the architect who was doing the drawing and telling him, move this here, move this there, do this this way, uh, before it was submitted finally to the vice chancellor and uh, to the tender board. Persons with disability, yes, uh, we haven't done very much. We have just formed... Um, a university committee on persons with a disability in KNUSC, of which I'm the a vice chair. So we are looking at innovative ways of providing access to persons with disability within the library. Uh, some of you who are familiar with KNUSC will know that the old uh, block uh, had, had, had a lift in it, which was never installed. I think that building was put up in 1972. Uh, as I speak to you now, we have a lift in that building. Um, uh, we have a lift in that building. At least it provides persons with disability uh, some uh, a way of moving up across the different floors. But we have to do more uh, in that area. I will leave it to my good friend, Mark, uh, to maybe add to it. Uh, I think I can hazard a guess on what the difference between learning commons and knowledge commons is. Uh, but since uh, they have uh, uh, used that distinction, I'll leave it to him to explain. Uh, but one is about learning and one is about knowledge. And there are learnings that don't lead to knowledge. But over to you, Joel Ati. Thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, my comment on the, on the question of uh, what to do with a limited space is that, um, as uh, my colleague Bradley said, is it in, in doing all this, the experiences that involve the professionals, involve the professionals. Because no matter how much the space is, you are not an architect. I'm happy one of my colleagues also said that there's a librarian who have actually that's 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 quite uh, unique. It's very difficult to come by. So we haven't done it here with that. In fact, the development office has attached a young architect to the library. So she's she's the if you like the liaison between the development office and the and the library. And we haven't done anything with that uh, knowledge. So and you, these people can think on the spot, that's their work. Just tell them what you want, and they will, they will have to draw something for you to see and you critique and agree on. So if you are professional about this, things, you get it right. Look, you don't have to have uh, all the commons everywhere. No, you can design one small place, take into consideration all the needs of the view. You can have a bit of a sofa in the corner to take care of uh, collaborative, a bit of a uh, uh, workstation, a bit so you can still design a small space and have everything a bit of everything in it if you really plan it so that's what i'll say about that one now um talking about the uh, accessibility of our libraries especially to the physical challenge 
I, I must say that is unfortunately I didn't have time to talk about ours. We we have uh, one of the best facilities for, for persons with, well, with special needs. Uh, we have a whole section in the library that deal with persons with special needs. Um, the location of this place is very critical. Uh, it's located in the basement, and there are reasons why we have it there, so that people who are physically challenged can access the place with their difficulties. And there's even uh, an external door where, when they need be, we open for them to go to go in and use your facility. Then we also have a lift, and we have uh, other assistive technologies that are there to help the the visually impaired and the the deaf and dumb and we have all those and if you listen to me very well i was saying that we are going to build a, a resource center uh, which will include computer special computer design for with assistive technologies to help people uh, who are who have special needs so i think we should deliberately as ucc has done in our libraries uh, ensure that and i and i'll say it again if you haven't yet this if you have the opportunity to now design a library, you need to factor this into your design. And if you already have a library and it's difficult to uh, create space for them, why not? Um, there are other things uh, you have to think about. If there's some space which is on the ground floor, or if you can go and negotiate for some space, some special place to, but they need they need our help. Uh, whatever you can do to get a space that they can easily can be accessible accessible to them, why not? Please work at it. So we should, if we are conscious about uh, creating easy accessibility to them, I'm sure we can do it. We can do it together, not alone with university management. Thank you very much. Yes, about the learning commons and the names. It just, uh, if you like, <laughs> um, <laughs> I agree. Uh, no, really, they are all commons. For me, <laughs> They are all learning commons. <laughs> it is about the, the distinction. You see, they are all commons. They are all learning commons. They are learning, they are learning, they are modern learning spaces. But uh, we demarcate this just to distinguish between uh, what purpose are they serving. Uh, in our case, for instance, the race common is for graduate students, um, uh, probably knowing what they need. It's based on their needs. Then the only common is for um, the undergraduate. Of course, they are not too much into research now. Uh, they are more of uh, into knowledge acquisition. Then there's a faculty, the senior members common, which is the like faculty commons. The the social learning commons, of course, as I explained to you, is for social learning. I mean, everything goes on there and uh, collaborative group learning. And so, uh, in our case. Uh, don't don't bring too much of the theory as such. We we it's just a, a just a, a convenient name to distinguish between. But they are all learning spaces, modern learning spaces, learning commons. Uh, I, I, I don't I'm not sure we want to go into the theory about this one. But it's just a matter of uh, helping us to distinguish between the various one and the purpose they are serving. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mark. Uh, just to add to what uh, Mark said about the. Uh, commons. When we say commons, it's something that is common to everyone. Uh, in my experience, um, the slight distinction is that you find that generally the learning commons are used by individuals for personal learning. Uh, so they congregate there and then they engage in learning in a very common place, utilizing technology. They can have a, a, a small discussions. But when it comes to the knowledge angle of things, you would find examples of people doing things together. So I have seen uh, students from the architectural department uh, coming to do drawings together and then they are discussing uh, very core concepts and what that means within a, a, a knowledge point of view and meaning making point of view uh, in a very collaborative manner. So. Uh, look, it's about semantics, but there are slight variations in emphasis. Uh, and like I said, one is about learning generally, and one is about the richness of the learning in terms of the depth of knowledge uh, that it generates. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you very much for your answers. I've looked through the chats. i um, seeing that most of the questions have been answered already from the 
chats and from the questions that came from here. A uh, hand has come up. Uh, just before I give the floor to this conclude to come up again, uh, let me acknowledge the presence of the GLA President Comfort. I think she's she's on the call, and then I see some experienced so leaders here. Mr. Ado is also on the call, and I'm seeing our colleagues from Nigeria. I hear it's raining a lot there, and it's making it difficult for you to tune in. Uh, we are sure that we would show or post these presentations online, the whole video, so that you would go through and then refresh yourself with whatever was presented here. And I'm seeing others also from outside of the Western African zone, people from East Africa and a few from Southern Africa zone. We appreciate all of your presence here, your contributions. We are hoping you will bring on board also your uh, expertise and experience when there's opportunity to do that. Uh, for now, let me also say that uh, Dr. Nikwe and Dr. Kovna, your colleague and your mate in your MA group, Dr. Olivia, says that uh, she's very impressed that you are shining the light for your year group. <laughs> so she's appreciative of that. Uh, Ms. Goklu, please uh, unmute yourself and, uh, okay, you have omitted yourself. Please come with your Follow up. Okay, Abed, please. I'm not Miss Koklu. I'm Koklu Lai. Okay, sorry. <laughs> yes. Miss Koklu Lai, sorry. Um, and just a note of caution. We have a huge complex here at Takwa. But at the beginning, the university was not planned with expansion in mind. So we ended up with squatters. Let me put it that way plainly. There were different offices here. If you have the opportunity, label all your rooms from scratch. Think deep into the future with all about all the facilities and the growth and the development of the institution, because that is what will inform your choice of spaces. Please don't entertain squatters. They are very difficult to uproot. My inputs. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, let's, no question. Let's, let's listen to uh, Professor Kakubi from uh, ATU, the Pro Vice Chancellor, for his contribution as well. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I just want to. Hello? Please go ahead. We can Hello, hear you. We can hear you, bro. Yes, the only comment I would like to make is that uh, for today, I've learned great things. Before coming to the seminar, myself, I had some ideas on many of the things, having read a number of documentation, but I think the presentation have actually educated us a lot. And especially taking from the experience of KNUST, that I should say they are giants in Ghana now, with all that they are doing, especially with the ideas of the library mall. And, uh, listening to the experience of Cape Coast, how they are growing in a similar manner. I think a lesson I have taken and i like to share with people is that uh, for young university coming up, let's not miss the, the necessary consideration that go into the, the design of a, a standard, you know, a world in a library that meet the expectation of the student we have today. Let's put all the necessary things together so that you will not have to go through and redesign and redesign to meet standard. But at once, let's meet the minimum standard and satisfy uh, our customers very well. There are quite a lot of other lessons, but I will leave it here and wish everyone well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Prof. Uh, I, um, I, um, uh, Abed. Yes, sir. Yeah, just a small comment on uh, uh, my sister Kokulu's comment about the uh, encroaches. <laughs> sometimes it's our own making. You see, sometimes the library is constructed and we don't have a plan as a library on how we want to use the library. It has happened a number of libraries that I know here. I don't want to mention names. And all of a sudden, they started sending professors and other people to go and occupy office space on the second floor. So, right down from the beginning of the construction if you i mean in her case she wasn't there let's own the building 
I'm 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 serving as a consultant for a private university that's that's built a three-story library for Hello? the university. And I have I just sent a report to the, the president that every space there I've written to him how it's going to be used and what is, what is needed. So I and the, the last time I said this three uh, I, I was hearing that they want to give one uh, one of the floor to ICT. I said no, there's no space for ICT there. Everything there, so no as I remain the consultant for the project has been utilized. So sometimes let's 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 I mean a place in within my own library was given to ICT. Now we can we need it for something, but we can't have it. Once you give the space out for something else, you will never have. There was even another space here that was being used for academic, uh, keeping academic ground university. When they even change the, the space, they have given it to another person. So, so that's what happens. So once you give out a space for something, you never have it back. So librarians, let's. It's like if you are involved in the construction, own the pro, own the project, have 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 a use for every minute, even the storeroom everywhere have a use for it. Document it. And let's fight for. It. Otherwise, our universities, uh, once they are under pressure, they will just take decisions and impose it on you. If you go to UHAS, where they are, is a library. Well, that was a faculty, a school library. But now that's where the academic chamber and, and uh, academic board chamber is. So it's, we need to look at this. It's, it's just a, an issue of convenience, and we should not allow it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Kavla, for that input. Um, I want to give the opportunity to someone from Kenya to also make a comment. Uh, Narisa from Kenya, can you unmute and give us a comment? Uh, thank you very much to the two presenters. It's been quite insightful. Uh, for me, the tech home is the mall. We need to be quite innovative as librarians. And of course, the role, the ball, and as the management support for management. So as much as we are talking about innovativeness and moving towards uh, this direction as librarians, we need to closely work together with the management of the different institutions. Of course, considering those factors, librarians think about low budgets, etc. but we really appreciate, and on behalf of my colleagues from East Africa, we are so happy that we've been able to join. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. There are some two questions, then I'll come back to the audience here. One is, uh, what is the sustainability strategy for tech? And with, with all these uh, different learning environments, uh, that is from Achirewa. And then another person is asking that we are talking about uh, changes in the learning environment. Is there a place for gamification in that environment? Uh, I want Dr. Nikwe to give an Hello. answer. Okay, uh, answer to the sustainability question. We are mindful of the fact that the student numbers keep on growing, and therefore there is no way you can physically uh, accommodate everyone in the library. Uh, it's the same problem to do with the student accommodation. Uh, so, like I said earlier on, the learning space is not physical, it's just physical. It is also very virtual. So, going forward into the future, we have to think very creatively about how we can provide uh, interactive learning environments in a virtual space uh, as part of how we actually enhance the learning experiences of our learners. I mentioned earlier on about uh, various um, approaches to online learning support. I mentioned Professor Julie Salmon. Uh, who developed something uh, in the Open University. But also, uh, KNUSC is moving out of the physical space of Kumasi. We have uh, uh, structures uh, coming up in Accra, in Tamale, in the, uh, Takradi, and many other places. So we are hoping to expand access to learning spaces into these new facilities uh, so that we can provide learning support and uh, 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 um, learning services to students who are not physically uh, located. Uh, so it goes back to the question of how we manage diversity of our students, the different student cohorts, and, 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 and how we support them. Uh, so that is what I would say about the uh, sustainability. Now, uh, the question of gamification. Um, I think if you go back to the ped innovative pedagogical models which I actually presented, you will find uh, a kind of pedagogy called play-based learning. Play-based learning. 
uh, gamification is coming from that theoretical point of view. Um, obviously, uh, the the view is that we are trapped in the mentality where it is as if learning is about teaching. And now, increasingly, we are realizing that we have to break out of that mode. And what game-based learning is doing is to say that let learning be fun. Make it something playful. When people uh, enjoy that excitement and the playful nature of it, they learn more easily and more quickly. Uh, and I am very grateful to see chess bots in Mark Anthony's uh, uh, what do you call it, a library in UCC. I think that is something that I don't have. Uh, I We will find various things that will make available, including online games, uh, authentic that students can play. But sometimes students want spaces to relax, and we can think about the various uh, games that we can actually have within our library space, if possible. It doesn't have to be physically inside the library. I talk about the outdoor. Uh, and therefore, these things can be available on the outdoor. At the end of the day, the important question is that are students learning? Not just acquiring information, are they learning? And, and are they learning or uh, cultivating new ideas that can inure to the development of our country and enhance uh, our well-being and livelihood? So that is what I would say. Thank you very much. Uh, there are two more hands showing up now. Fua and Poma and Uwa Ochi. Please, uh, let's start with Fua. Please unmute yourself and let's hear from you. Okay, thank you very much. I've learned a lot of things today. I'm not a librarian, but I think it was, it was worth joining. We've discussed a lot of things and um, growing up, I've been... Um, a library fan right from infancy and I would talk about two challenges I usually found in the library. One of them was the artificial lighting that were employed in the library and then the colors in the space. Um, I, I stopped attending a particular library because anytime I sat on a desk I would cast a shadow on the book I was reading. That meant that the light was behind me, up above the ceiling, and it wasn't working in the space. And um, I wasn't the only person not frequenting that particular library. Maybe others may had other issues. So um, it's one of the things that we need to importantly consider. And recently, if we are um, talking about sustainability goals, and we are looking at daylighting. I'm, I'm so shocked that in Ghana, we create large windows. Okay. And uh, we, we create large windows and we install blinds. And we put on the light in the library, even when it's daytime. I find that very funny because if we, we are looking at that target, now daylighting is, is precious, it's more important. Instead of us doing this, we go artificial. It's a challenge. And um, the other thing that I would also talk about is a uh, floor finish in the library. Um, sound is very important. I would liken the library to an auditorium. People walk, you know, you, if somebody has high heel, you hear the crow, crow, crow all over, then you are distracted. Maybe I'm a traditional learner type of person. So I don't want any distraction. I want to be focused. And that's, so those are the challenges that I found when I was growing up visiting libraries uh, here in Ghana. And I believe we could uh, look at these things in our libraries as well. Thank you. Thank you very much for your contribution. Uh, watch it, please unmute and let's hear from you. Well, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Super fantastic presentations by Dr. Kobler and Dr. Nikwe. Yeah, I, I believe that all the things that Dr. Nikwe and uh, Dr. Kobler has, they've done in their various institutions doesn't, didn't come cheap in terms of money. And I'm sure it thinks many people are excited about it and many librarians are excited about it and therefore they would want to do the similar things in their various libraries. Just want us to... I just want to ask if you can, they both can share with, the, uh, with us 
the strategies that they use in getting the money because anything that is nice it comes with money and everything that they have done is very nice mm -hmm. so how did they go about with the money getting i mean pushing for money to develop such a such a place all right thank you thank you very much richard Lanty. um i can see uh, michael it, it michael hello. please hello um yeah thank you Th thank you mr abed um my just a uh, comment about uh, the two presentations. Yeah, first of all, I must congratulate uh, my comment, the two presentations, Dr. Uh, Nikwe and Dr. McAntony. It's a very wonderful presentation. Now, my comment first, uh, two comments here. One is about uh, our colleagues who were talking about uh, limited spaces. Um, my comment here would be that, uh, you see, when you talk about spaces, and I think the two presenters also said it, we should only we shouldn't only look at inside, we should also look at the outside space. Sometimes you may have a limited space, but within your surroundings outside, there may be spaces there on use. One of the emerging uh, uh, trends coming on is, is a, a outside spaces. People are excited, people are very happy with uh, the outside environment. So there is a new trend coming up with uh, what we call summer hard space learning. Around the space, around the comp, around the library, you can put up summer, uh, summer hats and then put in, sometimes people even make concrete slabs or you can put in uh, immovable chairs over there and the student enjoy, even the, the uh, um, um, we talk of um, uh, faculty members. You can make use of those outside. You see, this time, you might be honest as librarians, students don't need this uh, so much, this uh, inside space where it is packed with chairs and books. No, students actually need what we what I call learning spaces, other than these uh, spaces full of books and chairs, they need learning spaces with technology. So if you have your Wi-Fi around the place, you can make very good use of these uh, outside uh, summer hard spaces. You can even put up a common shed, just a shed, and then you stop it with nice furniture. Student will use it, and you can make use of the the, the limitation that you have inside. Then the second comment uh, is about the. Uh, um, yes, as uh, the two presenters said, they have done very well. We are all happy, as uh, Dr. Lamti said right now. But the issue is that the, some of so people want to emulate, people want to do it. But one thing I must say here is that they must be very cautious about resistance. If we allow them to share their experience with the two librarians, they can talk and talk and talk. There was a very a stiff re re resistance for these changes. I was deeply involved with the Ken West, so I can talk for, on that. Even not just uh, uh, within uh, uh, the library facility, library, uh, the library, and library administrators, academics, and even within the library, librarians itself, some were opposed to that. Why else should we take these things? Why do we change this? Why do we take this out? It was a very, very, very fierce resistance. So if you want to do this, uh, and as, as uh, uh, they said, you need, you need to be very strong. You need to be resolute. You need to be assertive and be on top of, 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 your, of your job and a profession to be able to convince. And there's also the need for, and I think that's what uh, it, it, it was for them, the need for consultation, the need to talk to people and explain I, I to them why this thing should be done. So I think the advice I will have for those who want to go for that, uh, that direction, that they should be cautious, they should be ready, that there will be resistance. But with, uh, with, with, with assertiveness, with college and then uh, being on top of their job they will, and then consultations. You don't have to be, I'm the professor, I know. Engage with them, explain to them, and let them buy into your idea. And with that, you can get there uh, uh, and then we can all develop as a profession. Thank you. All right. Thank you so very much. Thank you so very much for your contributions. Uh, I'll tell you an interesting story. Uh, that I heard from a seminar that the, there was this uh, company where productivity seemed to be going down every day, and so the consultant, a consultant, was employed to come and see why the staff would spend more time out of their their specified places of work. So the consultant came around. Everything looked fine. Machines, high tech, everything was fine. Kept going round, round, round. Then eventually, he went to the washroom, and then he came out 
and then he asked where all the workers seem to be spending most of their times. And uh, he said that the people kept going to the washroom and it, it was for them, it looked more than normal. That the number of times they have to visit the washroom and to spend some time in the washroom. Then the consultant said, okay, change this color from this existing color to this color. And let's see what changes would come. Now, what was happening was that the, the, the work was really vigorous. So they, they, they got tired and there was very little resting time. So whenever they went to the washroom, the coloring of the washroom gave them some calmness and uh, it, pro it produced a condition where they could feel calm and rest a little bit. So it wasn't that they were going to pee or something like that. They were just going to find some solace and some comfort and rest a little bit. Now, when the color was changed, it was changed to such an outrageous color that if you enter the room, you are you feel like something is scaring you out of the room. So now, before we went to the washroom, and within seconds, we're out. Yeah, you could not stay there again to go and rest. Mm -hmm. So you see, the coloring alone can have an influence on when people come into the library. Somebody just spoke about shadows coming from where the lighting was located. And I still see a lot of libraries now, they are cube shaped the heavy columns all around where there should have been windows and open spaces so that natural light would be utilized. There is a library, I think it's in Sweden, Netherlands, that has four or so floors and there's no light inside the library building. All the light, the design is such that I was trying to look for the image. If I see the image, I was still show it before we go. All the light that comes out. <laughs> All the light that comes out are uh, light from the sunlight and it shows through the whole of the building. And the building has been structured like a spiral staircase. So people are sitting along the all the floors and it's such a beautiful building. I think the libraries must begin to look at when they have to design, to design such that we have some modernity in the designs, some futuristic designs that will make the library stand out. I don't know if if, if you have seen that building in Dubai, which is called the Library of the Future or something, the Museum of the Future. Uh, if you have time, please look for it. It's called the Museum of the Future. It's in Dubai. Uh, you can search for the building and see and read about it, and then you understand what I'm talking about. So these things are there, and they are interesting things to do. Uh, I think uh, librarians must begin to also Personally, my take is that the spaces that we are talking about here should also be including uh, cloud spaces uh, or uh, I'll say uh, uh, IT spaces where we can create, like uh, Dr. Nico, Nico said, if you create a, a game, how do you play the game? So that even the library is off, people can still log in and then be playing the games or doing some learning through some games online. I'm looking at all those things not just the physical ones. I'm also looking at electronic spaces where we can continue to engage our students in the learning process, put notes there, put games there, create groups so that people can log in and have chat on their groups. When school is on vacation, how do they communicate when they are at homes, one at Tamale, one at Accra? How do they connect mm -hmm. and continue mm -hmm. whatever has to be done? Collaborative learning. I think we should also begin to look at spaces online as well so that we are providing them the needs that will help them do the things that they need to do to gain knowledge and not just education without knowledge. Uh, Dr. Floki, please unmute and then I think no, we can... No, no, please, Mr. Abed, please, my question, the question about finances, that hasn't been answered, please. Okay, all right. The strategy in adapt, I mean, getting money to do... Uh, some of these fantastic things and as i mean many many as i said many libraries or librarians may want to go to that use that model how do Sorry, we I, I i almost forgot that we will let them because answer because that. i realized that you were you were, you were no no uh, let, let, let dr dr Floki and uh, answer the question and then i would uh, ask a question or contribution and then i'll let them answer and then we can run up so that people can log off Abed, i think when it comes to this dr nikwe and i Dr. McCobler has the experience. So if they can share with us how they want to so I want to come with your comment, comment or question, and then oh, they'll okay. answer to it. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, let me thank uh, 
both presenters, and Dr. Kobla, thank you so much. Let me say congratulations for your 60th anniversary and also for the wonderful things that you are doing. Dr. Nikwe, thank you so much. My problem is you don't have the library building. You are fighting for a library building. You are pushing for it. And yet they don't want to give you a, a purpose board library, but they want to incorporate maybe staff common rooms. Uh, and they will continue telling you that the structure is not only for the library. So what can you do to convince management to understand that you need a library solely for library building? Thank you very much for your question. I think okay. I think we will allow them to answer the question. Okay, Dr. Kamala will begin. Yeah, so thank you very much. Uh, talking about uh, Richie's question, um, to be very frank with you, uh, I, we, are, we appreciate that challenge. Um, uh, you know, the mindset of some of our leaders about libraries, some feel that there, there's no need for a library. Uh, there's no need putting money into the library again because these days the students don't need the libraries. It's not true. Um, but it's all about advocacy is all about communication. Um, how do you communicate your vision to management? It's very important. It's also about your own posture, your own attitude. So a number of things come together. Um, for instance, when I took over the management for this library, I, I, I did an assessment of the library, what I inherited, and I what I wanted to do, and I, 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 I went to present my my plan to the vice chancellor, the then vice chancellor. I, the way I communicated my message to him, I think he bought into some of my ideas, and I'm sure Dr. Nikwe will say the same thing about the moral concept because I think he was well consulted by the vice chancellor. I'm, I'm, I don't need to take this from him because we have had some discussion, and this was part of the vision of the. Is current vice chancellor. So, the advocacy, the communication, the message you have is very important. Sometimes that's where we we get it wrong. Uh, if you package your message very well and you are convincing, and the other thing is that when when you are even given the opportunity, uh, when you get a support, sometimes it comes in faces. People will judge you from. So it's like the money was coming as and when they give you, you do one, and they are convinced. And everybody's happy about it. They give. You. I mean, my second project, my my, my only common. It was just within a week. When we were having the after we launched the first one, which my chancellor was around, uh, Doctor Sam Jonah, and as we were having lunch together, and one of the provosts of our colleges was there, then the chancellor asked, "What next?" The one said, "Oh, uh, I said we have another. It's a, it's, a, it's a trip. It's a three in one project. We just have another one. Say, how much do we need?" I mean, in a week's time, I had a letter from the colleague that we are giving you this amount of money to support the next one. So what I mean is that it depends on how you communicate your vision and how you how you how you carry yourself. Because uh, uh, and of course, please do not make the the money number one. Otherwise, you can't do it. Do not make the money number one. I've always said that the last thing you should consider in every project in any initiative is the money. If you make the money number one, you will never do it. And I'm speaking out of experience. Plan, have your plan, communicate your plan, look for possible so, uh, source of funding, and take it from there. I had my plan and had my 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 vision, what I want to do. And I when I talk to the vice chancellor, I say, hey, there's no money. When you call it, they say this. But I said, Vice Chancellor, give, can you give me the opportunity to go to and see my chancellor? He gave me the chance. I went to him. The chancellor came in and supported the idea. He came with his own personal support. So it's like, it's about communication. It's about your own distance. So that's what I would say about that. It's about how we communicate, the advocacy, and how we carry ourselves in the university, and how we champion some of these things in the university. They are all helpful. But don't make the money number one. If you make the money number one, you will never do it. Once you have made, you have the, a great idea, communicate the idea to the right persons, and you will be lucky for your management to buy into it. That's what I'll say about this, anyway. 
Doctor, you can add to it. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mark. Uh, and uh, in answer to my colleague who asked the question, uh, has been involved in the redesigning uh, the science uh, College of Science Library, so it would have been helpful. Uh, I wanted to bring that perspective to my presentation. Uh, but uh, if you ever visit KNUST, please go to the College of Science Library. They have fantastic uh, facilities there in terms of learning space. Uh, and I'm, I'm proud of my college librarian for the work that he has done there. But in answer to the question about where do you get money from, uh, uh, there are a number of things that you have to think about. Uh, first of all, you need to have an idea. <laughs> because without an idea, nobody will be willing to put money into it. So you have to dream. Uh, and have an idea, and the idea should be very clear and refined. Uh, but talking about strategies for how you actually get money for this, I would I can mention a couple, uh, but I'll just maybe highlight one or two. Uh, what I did when I started as a university librarian is that there's a, a procurement and budgeting cycle within the university, and it is a great opportunity to capitalize on and then draw a procurement plan of all the things that you need uh, linked to the university's um, strategic vision and the library's own strategic vision and plan and say that on the basis of where the university wants to go, these are activities that I want to engage in within the library to support that vision. Uh, management will be more than happy to listen to it once you can demonstrate a connection between what you want to do in the library and the that strategic direction of the institution. So that is very, very key uh, to be very clear in your mind how these various activities align uh, with the university's core business and strategic uh, 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 plan. You, you, you must be on top of that. Uh, the second uh, approach, apart from the budgeting and uh, procurement so that you have something that you can very confidently justify is that you have to look for little opportunities um, i'll be very careful in how i present this here uh, but when i started i saw an opportunity where uh, the vice chancellor the, the vice chancellor at the time i joined was about to uh, uh, finish his tenure and a new vice chancellor was coming Normally, when they are coming in, they want ideas uh, to prepare themselves for uh, their uh, uh, interview. Uh, and they are scouting all over the place. So I saw a wonderful opportunity to go and sell an idea to my incoming vice chancellor. And I say, look, uh, in terms of applying for this job, uh, here are a few things that you can say. Uh, it provided a platform for me to vigorously sell the learning angle of the things that we do and why and how we could do it better. Uh, mindful of the growing population of students' issues uh, about uh, challenges they face, I had actually gone out and taken pictures of students learning under mango trees in the dark, and I had those pictures to show him. And I said, look, do you think it is very fair for the students to be paying money and learning in these horrible spaces? So timing the advocacy with uh, people who are looking for opportunities for leadership management, uh, leadership and management in the university is very key and very strategic. Uh, the library mall came up as a result of the fact that my current uh, 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 vice chancellor, when she was pro vice chancellor and sat on the library committee meeting, I used the opportunity to uh, uh, mute that idea and say, look, we need a library mall. He said, me, what, what do you mean by a library mall? Can you explain? And I had actually thought about it as a concept. So when I uh, explained it, she was like, wow. And so when the opportunity came for her to apply, uh, she said, look, can you elaborate more on this idea? I really want to use it. And I did a write up for her uh, on it. And thankfully, when she actually got the job, he said, I promise I will do this and I'm going to do it. So there are two big projects that she is doing and the library mall is one of the key. In fact, the library mall is progressing much faster than the other one. Uh, and I'm grateful to her for uh, uh, honoring her word. 
So it is about planning, it's about advocacy, it's about deep and creative thinking. But like my good friend Mark said, it doesn't have to be money coming from the university alone. Recently, we have had uh, 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 computers delivered to us. We had to go and lobby SIC uh, with a proposal, and they were very happy and bought into it and then gave us. I talked earlier on about the learning uh, 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 den, which we have created more like a, a learning commons, uh, depending on how you look at it. Uh, but we work with the alumni of the uh, KNUSC alumni in the USA to actually put that in place. Uh, so there has to be various ways in which uh, you can actually uh, 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 finance these projects. Uh, and yes, it is challenging uh, and it is not easy uh, from a change management point of view. Nonetheless, it is doable if you are committed and you really want to brace uh, yourself uh, and respond to all the uh, challenges and the needs. All I say is that Rome was not built a day uh, uh, in one day, room was not built in one day, but it was built a day at a time. So, with small, small steps, you get uh, you get very far. Thank you very much. We thank all our presenters and all those who have asked questions and those who have contributed and those who have been in attendance. It's been a very wonderful experience. And let's keep the conversation going. You see, the best conversation is the one that never ends. So we are going to keep it going. At this point, uh, I would want to hand over to Mrs. Senyeja to, to conclude our meeting for us with a vote of thanks and uh, a summary of what has happened so far. But we are grateful to you. We started, we had 170 people. We have gone a long way looking at the cost of data these days. Uh, we still have over 100 people here with us. And we are grateful to you all for your time spent with us. I will hand over to Mrs. Uh, Vivian Senyeja to bring our meeting to an end for us. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Colette, for the opportunity. And I want to say, um, apologize sincerely for not being able to connect on time. Hmm, it's a big problem. Initially, I was not able to connect now I'm connected, the lights are off here. So I'm using my phone and I hope I'll be able to conclude before the battery also runs down. I hope you can hear me. I hope you can hear me now from my phone. Yes, yes you can hear me. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. I also want to use the opportunity to thank Dr. Nikwe and Dr. Makobla yeah, we can so hear much. You. Okay. We so appreciate the wonderful work that you are doing and then the wonderful presentation. We are so grateful. And I should say that they are two sides of the same coin. We are all aiming at achieving the same goal. And you have all said a lot, but I try to summarize it or put it in my own ways so that we bring this um, program to an end. Uh, I want to say that conventionally, academic libraries have been physically set up for quiet, solitary work. As the presenters have all mentioned earlier, but from recent past, Library users, especially students, want to be social and often get group assignments, need a workshop space to suit them. The new trend of library collaborative spaces where people can assess resources while sitting, talking, and working at the same time has arrived, calling on all universities to respond to their demands of the time. Redesigning our academic library spaces has become a contemporary issue. And it's an issue of concern in tertiary institutions, especially in recent times, where the changing patterns of sophisticated information needs 
of library users are growing rapidly. Many scholars are advocating for user-oriented design principles that allow multifunctional space to promote active learning among library users when designing and building libraries. I think this one was noted in both Dr. Nikwes and uh, Dr. Mark Cobbler's presentation. One of our oldest researchers, McDonald, established 10 key qualities of a, a good library, a good learning space, which he said include functional, adaptable, accessible, varied, interactive, conducive, environmentally suitable, safe, secure, efficient, and suitable for information technology. I think Dr. Nipe mentioned a greater part of that also, security and efficiency. The library users of the present generation have high expectations to achieve in terms of information, communication, technology. The question that remains unanswered is whether the McDonald's 10 qualities of a good library space has been achieved. And I want to say here that we are still on it. We are still trying to get there. So what is the way forward now? Redesigning of the library spaces for the futuristic view is all user-centric and university's mission-oriented task. However, there are certain points to be taken into consideration while doing this exercise. And I think most of the questions have been centered around that. Some, some of these are to determine appropriate partners our clients or uh, gain future budgetary comments, which uh, most people ask about funding. How are we able to fund? How are we able to sustain? And then we also have to determine specific locations with architects, which KMUST also is still leading by the new library mall that is coming up very soon. And then we have to also um, define our services that we offer with human resource needs and funding. We have to also factor in staff training because we need staff to facilitate the implementation. So in conclusion, what can we see? The functions of an academic library will continue to exist, but a number of conventional things will change drastically due to the application of ICT. The academic library can assume all kinds of appearances, either in digital or physical forms, off-campus or on-campus access to information resources. The library user of the future will not only be an information consumer, but also an expert partner in the library's continued innovation, innovation and information services. Hence, the library will again be a pleasant space to everybody for everything. Thank you very much once again for the presentation and the audience, thank you for your time. Thank you. Ms. Abed and Mrs. Selikem, over to you. All right, thank you very much. Um, we are so grateful to all the presenters. I can see um, um, Apostle Enes Buachi, who is the founder and overseer of Life City Church with so many branches all over Ghana. We want to say thank you for joining. And I just want to thank all the presenters, Dr. Nikwe and Dr. Mark Anthony. You just you didn't just give us theory, you gave us some practicals. And we hope that we'll have the opportunity to consult you when we are trying to 
emulate your ideas on learning spaces in academic libraries. So to all our continental and international participants, we just want to say thank you. And to all our participants in Ghana, both in, in Ghana too, we just want to say thank you for joining and thank you very much. Thank you all the, the co-moderators, Mr. Qualite and Madam Vivian, thank you very much. So this webinar has come to a close. Thank you all for joining. See you uh, next so time. We would, we would share the, 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 the links when we post it, we upload it to um, YouTube so that everyone here would have opportunity to play back and listen. Thank you all so very much thank also. You. They probably see. Uh, I'm not sure. Here, it was. Okay. Yes, I'm here. Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> if you want to say, yeah, any concluding remarks before we totally disappear? Yes, I, I just want to say that uh, it's been really educative and um, interesting. There was quite a lot of lessons to learn. I, I really appreciate the participation from everyone, and also. The, the effort of the, the speakers in bringing us up to, to speed and information in regard to the topic, which itself are deemed to be very modern and realistic, looking at the challenges we are facing now. Well, what i like to say finally is that most of the time we attend things like this, we need to pick a lesson and put that lesson in practice, let that lesson change something in the way we are doing things every day. And so I shared my lesson earlier, and I kept it again. The issue of modernizing our library is quite, is quite interesting. It's to pave way for a new type of student to have a hard work on peace, you know, enthusiasm and love in enjoying the library work and promoting academic work in general. So I thank you very much for the participation. And I believe that each and every one of us has learned something and will put it in practice to make a change in the way we run our library. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your day. Yo, bye. Evening. Yeah, thank you and bye-bye. Thank Come you, bye-bye. Well, well done. Bye -bye. From Nigeria. <laughs> thank you, Nigeria uh, and uh, those from the African diaspora.